why don't we begin with prayer, and then uh, we're going to go through a whole series tonight on, it's called Living in Today's uh, culture as a Christian, a lot of the focus is going to be on the book of Jeremiah and the focus is going to be on um, uh, the, the, the book of Jeremiah and, and just the whole idea of the exile and how uh, Israel was taken into exile. So let's begin with prayer and jump jump in. Yeah, sound is on, no video is on. You, you know, it's okay. That's all right. I... I still got the COVID haircut, so maybe you don't want to see the COVID haircut. Okay. All right, let's pray. Lord God, Lord God, thank you for this time to study your word. Pray that as we discuss your word that we would leave here uh, stronger Christians, deep, more deeply rooted in the scriptures. We're transformed by the gospel. We know how to live out our core values as Christians and yet still interact with our culture around us. We pray also for all the people who, are, who aren't at peace right now, all of the division in our country, all of the unrest. Uh, show us how to further your kingdom of peace, your kingdom of justice, your kingdom of glory, uh, in the in the midst of all this, in your name we pray, Amen. Okay, so if you, you've been following along, we're reading through the book of Jeremiah right now, and um, and so uh, wanted to focus on the exile. Now I, I mentioned this last time. If you grew up in a Christian church or maybe went to a Christian grade school. Almost all of the kids' Bible stories that I've seen, I mean, a lot of the liturgy uh, or liturgical church calendar, a lot, of the, a lot of the things that you'll see about the Old Testament are creation, Adam and Eve, uh, the fall, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph in the technicolor dream coat, Moses leading God's people out of Egypt, um, and then Joshua leading the people into the promised land and the first couple kings like Saul and David and Solomon. And then after Solomon, things just kind of cut off. We don't, for whatever reason, we don't teach much in our younger grades, in our schools, a lot of times in our Bible history classes, maybe in, um, maybe, you know, just your understanding probably ends with Solomon. Well, Solomon lived 900 years before Jesus. And a ton happened after King Solomon. Um, Solomon, because of all of his wives, um, brought all sorts of idolatry in the land. And God um, disciplined Solomon. And because of the consequences of Solomon's sin, um, the nation of Israel was split into two. The ten northern tribes, which were known as Israel, and then the one left uh, tribe at the bottom, uh, Judah, surrounding Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, where the temple was. And the northern tribes just fell into horrible idolatry, uh, never had a good king, and by uh, 722, the, they were carried off in exile by the Assyrians, the, the world power at that time. The capital of Assyria was Nineveh, if that city sounds familiar from the stories of Jonah. And then the southern tribe of Judah had this opportunity to repent and not follow the ways of, um, of, of the northern tribes, and they didn't. Uh, they, they followed the ways of the northern tribes. They did the same kind of sin, and they were led into Babylonian exile. Now, the difference with the southern tribes is they would come back after 70 years. But you really need to know something about this. So I'm going to read you a quote of the significance of the Babylonian exile. And um, this is a quote from Tim Mackey, one of the leading theologians with the Bible Project. And he says this, For the Israelites, the exile was the watershed moment of their history on which the entire Bible gains its significance. Everything else orbits around the gravity of this faith-shaking moment. And so the exile into Babylon is one of the most powerful, uh, altering moments in Israel's history. The two big events, being freed from Egyptian slavery and going into Babylonian exile, are the two key 
uh, events in the Old Testament that really formed God's people, changed God's people, that was really a big deal. And so you can't emphasize this enough. It's a huge theme of the Bible, and that's why I love teaching it, because it's not taught very much in our grade schools and schools and our churches. You need to know about the Babylonian exile. My wife is sick of me talking about the Babylonian exile at dinner conversation, but it's such an important event. Okay. Now, the first time that it was predicted is in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 28 when, when Moses is talking about um, the blessings and curses of following God. So back in 14, four, uh, 1400 B.C., Moses is already predicting the exile, saying if you don't follow the Lord, if you give yourself over to foreign gods, um, you're going to go into Babylon. You're going to be taken into, uh, into a foreign land. So uh, Deuteronomy 28 is the first time. And then and we hear lots of other predictions uh, about this Babylonian captivity. Uh, one of them is 2 Kings chapter 21. 2 Kings chapter 21 says this. The Lord said through his servants, the prophets, Manasseh, or king of Judah, has committed um, these detestable sins. He has done more evil than the Amorites who preceded him and has led Judah into sin with his idols. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, said, God of Israel says. I'm going to bring such disaster on Jerusalem, Judah, that the ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. I will stretch out over Jerusalem a measuring line used against Samaria and the plumb line used against the house of Ahab. I will wipe out Jerusalem as one wipes a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. I will forsake the remnant of my inheritance and give them into the hands of enemies. They will be looted and plundered by all their enemies they have done evil in my eyes and have roused my anger from the day their ancestors came out of Egypt until this day. So, um, Hezekiah, one of the few good kings in the south, had all of these great reforms in Judah. Uh, he got the people to practice the Passover again, to read the, word to get, read the word again. But then Hezekiah's son, Manasseh, um, he fell just total black sheep. He, he sinned more than any of the, the kings before him. He was very much like King Ahab in the north. He, he gave himself into all the foreign kings of the Canaanites. He sacrificed his children to the god of Molech. He, he had all sorts of, you know, brought in all sorts of sexual sinful practices of uh, Asherah's uh, god of sex and, and Baals and power, all of that. So, um, so the prophets predicted that just like Assyria came in and took away the northern tribes, they call here the, the tri or Samaria, the north, and in 722, now God was going to wipe out Judah as somebody wipes out a dish. So that was um, a, a prediction. Now, if you're following along in our daily readings, recently, I, I'm a day or two ahead, I think I'm a, I'm a day ahead, um, I think this was yesterday's reading was Jeremiah 32. Where, where Jeremiah is, is the prophet who lived during the exile. He lived about 620 B.C., uh, uh, for about uh, 60 years or so after that. Um, and he, he was the prophet preparing God's people to be taken off into exile. And in Jeremiah chapter 32, the, the book of Jeremiah, a little background here, book of Jeremiah is, the, I believe, the longest book in the Old Testament. Um, it's not in chronological order. It's a bunch of uh, seemingly random sermons uh, that are kind of structured together according to themes so that the center of the book is kind of the main point of the book. Um, but, but Jeremiah is also one of the most passionate prophets where he's just pouring out his heart. He's called a weeping, the weeping prophet because he says, you know, I wish my, my, my eyes, my head was like a fountain so I could weep as much as I feel, how deeply I feel for the people as they refuse to repent and turn back to the Lord. Um, but here in Jeremiah chapter 32, um, Jeremiah is told to buy a field. Uh, in Jerusalem or in Judah, and which is pretty remarkable because 
that's going to get ransacked. You don't buy property in a place that's going to get invaded. But he was told by God to buy a piece of property in hope that one day uh, they would come back to land. And so here's Jeremiah predicting the Babylonian captivity, but also their restoration. Jeremiah 32, verses 37, or 32 through 37. The people of Israel and Judah have provoked me by all the evil they have done. They, their kings and officials, their priests and prophets, the people of Judah and those living in Jerusalem, they turn their backs to me and not their faces. Though I taught them again and again, they would not listen or respond to discipline. They set up their vile images in the house that bears my name and defiled it. They built high places for Baal in the valley of ben Himen to sacrifice their sons and daughters to Molech. Though I never commanded, nor did it enter my mind, that they should do such a detestable thing so, and so make Judah sin. Um, and so he's saying that you know, they, they were just horrible. They sacrificed their sons and daughters to this god Molech. Uh, there's... there's ancient uh, kind of pictures of this God. It kind of had these arms that were out like this and they would have kind of a fire under its belly and you would lay your children, they would roll into the fire um, as a way to sacrifice your children to please the God of Molech. You know, and God says, I never would, that would never have crossed my mind to do such a thing. Verse 36. You are saying about this city, by the sword, famine, and plague, it will be given into the hands of the king of Babylon. But this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I will surely gather them from all the lands where I banish them in my furious anger and great wrath. I will bring them back to this place and let them live in safety. So he predicted their exile. He predicted because of their wickedness, because of their sin, um, they would be completely destroyed. The temple would be destroyed. They'd be carried off in exile for 70 years. But then God would return them. So here's some application points. I'm, uh, again, encouraging you to chime in and, and respond and let's talk about this. Um, one of the things you'll find in the book of Isaiah, is, I mean Jeremiah, is he's always speaking against false prophets. And the false prophets were the ones who were saying, you're not going to go into exile. You're not going to go into Babylon. If you do get attacked by Babylon, it's going to be okay. Maybe they'll take you away for a year or two, but you'll come back right away. Don't worry, it's all going to be okay. And what made them false prophets is a false prophet comforts the comfortable. The people were already comfortable in their sin. They were comfortable strained from God, worshiping these false gods, worshiping money and sex and power and, and sacrificing even their children to get these things. And a false prophet will not speak against sin. A, a false prophet will make the comfortable or comfort the comfortable. A true prophet afflicts the comfortable and comforts the afflicted. So Jeremiah had to speak a word of of. of of affliction to the comfortable, of judgment, of a need to repent. And then you see that later on in the book of Jeremiah, he also speaks incredible words of comfort, and we'll get to that, about restoration, about reconciliation to those people who've been afflicted. And that leads to my, my third point here. Um, in today's you know, we really in today's world, we really need to be careful about consumeristic. Christianity, consumer Christianity. The, this idea, I go to the church or I listen to the pastor that makes me feel good or never challenges me or, you know, I just go to the place that, that meets my needs. Um, you know, it's in the book, I think it's in Isaiah, it says, you know, the prophets who preach about how to make beer would be just the kind of people for, 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 for Israel. You know, that they were, just, they were just telling people what they wanted to hear. You know, it didn't matter. they weren't ever challenging the people. They weren't ever calling them to repentance. And I think that's kind of the, 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 the challenge for me as a pastor is I, uh, who, do, who needs to hear comfort? Who needs to be challenged? Who needs to be brought to repentance? You know, and there's always that, that fear of or, or that, um, that temptation to want to be popular, to want to fill up the church. 
But, you know, false churches, Mormon tabernacles, are filled with people. Uh, so just filling up a church doesn't mean you're a true preacher. Doesn't mean you're the right church. Numbers don't really tell you much about if it's true or not. So uh, just, um, and yet, when people do turn to the Lord and they, they do accept their sin, they do uh, face their sin, that those people uh, need to hear comfort and peace and a message of reconciliation. And so um, you got to make sure you don't get legalistic. And so that, that can be a, a huge challenge. And so I have this kind of discussion question here, uh, and I'm looking for your feedback. Explain all the reasons that it can be hard to distinguish between false and true preachers. Can you, I'll take a drink of water for dramatic pause and let you respond to that. Um, all the reason that's hard to distinguish between true and false preachers. A, a true preacher like Jeremiah preached, it's not going to be good. We're going into exile. God is going to punish you for your sin. He is going to discipline you, uh, calling people to repentance, even if that meant he was thrown into a cistern, even if that meant that he was going to be, um, he was going to, to, to be persecuted and uh, risk his life. So, Anyone, anyone have some ideas on that? You know, the application question. Explain all the reasons it can be hard to distinguish between false and true prophets. What do you guys think? Anyone here? You guys have any thoughts? Jill, any thoughts? Nancy, any thoughts? You're typing. All right. That's okay. I can do a dance. A long, dramatic pause of water. Reichert's, any thoughts on that? That's really good. You know, that's really good. Okay, uh, the Lowe's family says you get caught up by the personalities. Um, uh, here... Amy said here, you know, that the false prophets will give you a half-truth. And that's totally the work of the devil. The devil never says a full lie or a full uh, deception. The, the devil always um, tells you half-truth. And so that's the part, like, what is the half-truth that's the truth? And what part of it, you know, even when the devil is tempting Jesus, he quotes scripture, you know, didn't God say that, you know, that, uh, that he will command his angels concerning you and you won't strike your foot against a stone? And he kind of half quotes Psalm 91. So, yeah, uh, Schmidt family says they all seem to preach Jesus. Yeah, I mean, everybody says Jesus. You say the name Jesus. I, I mean, even the Mormon church will say Jesus or or. Even, you know, uh, just Christian churches that maybe are, are preaching a false message will talk about Jesus. And so, and, and that's what made it so hard, I think, in Jeremiah's day is that the false preachers were preaching peace. And there were times when Jeremiah preached peace. You know, who's going to be against peace? Uh, but but uh, Jeremiah responded, peace, peace when there is no peace. You know, you guys are using God's peace, God's love as a license to sin. You're using the temple as a good luck charm as, a, as an excuse to sin. So, yeah. You know, so, so it can be hard to figure out who to follow. Numbers don't tell you the answer always because um, there's a lot of great churches that are large and false churches that are large. There's a lot of great churches that are small and there's false cultish churches that are small, Right? Everyone claims to be speaking the word of God. Yeah, thank you, Thad and Ann. You know, so, so that's, that can be really challenging. And so um, just think about how challenging both Isaiah and Jeremiah's ministry was that they had to just be totally convinced about what they believed, about God's word. At uh, the beginning of the book of Jeremiah, his calling is to, is to uproot uh, to tear down, uh, to destroy, and then to build and to plant. So he had to uproot all of these 
false ideas. He had to preach a message of justice and judgment. Um, yeah, Bob said that sometimes it's the part they aren't saying. Uh, like it's not calling sin, sin. Yeah, so what people, you know, the half-truth that's in there or then what's left out, what is not talked about. Right, very good. And that's a challenge, you know, like I, I think about that as a pastor. I want to be a missional pastor. I want to speak in ways that anybody could understand. So if somebody doesn't understand sin or sin now is kind of like, oh, I ate a carton of ice cream. That was so sinful or sinfully good. You know, that sin is not seen as like, uh, a, 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 an infraction against God or, or, or um, and so sometimes I use different words like brokenness or um, and so is the pastor or leader trying to be you know trying to explain things in a way people understand or trying to soften the truth just to give itching ears what they want to hear and so Jeremiah is a great man just a great example of somebody who's willing to say we're going into Babylon, our temple is going to be destroyed, and it's all your fault because you didn't repent. From the priest and the prophets all the way down to the peasants, and I don't care what you do to me, I love you enough to tell you the truth. And that's a, a, a powerful example for all of us. Okay, anything else on that topic? Anyone? So that's the prediction of the exile. So the exile is predicted, and if you've been reading along, my goodness, um, it's like, how many times do you need to hear, repent, repent, or you're going to be taken into exile? It's all throughout the first half of Isaiah. Isaiah's preaching over and over again. Jeremiah is saying it over and over again. Um, you know, as we read through Second Kings, they were saying it over and over again. And so it's all over the Bible. So you've heard that a lot. And I just took out two sections of, of the exile uh, being predicted. Now the exile experienced. So I have some dates here uh, that the, the Babylonian invasion. So Nebuchadnezzar was this great king, uh, uh, emperor who took over the world. So uh, Tiglath, Pileser, and Sennacherib were the, were the emperors who were the Assyrian emperors, and, Neb and they ruled the world for a, a time. And then Babylon has been around since the days of the Tower of Babel. That's the same people. They've been around really literally for thousands of years by now, but not as a world power, kind of a dormant um, empire or dormant nation, people group. But then under the leadership of Nebuchadnezzar, they just explode. They take over the world. Um, and, and Nebuchadnezzar goes on this campaign to invade Egypt in about 605 uh, B.C. And it was about that same time in 605 B.C. where Nebuchadnezzar makes his first attack on Jerusalem. Now there's some discrepancy on the dates. If you go to the book of Daniel in chapter 1, it seems like he came in 605. If you go to um, 2 Kings 24, it seems like according to that dating, uh, um, it was in 597. Maybe there were two first invasions in 605 and then 580 or 597. But basically what Nebuchadnezzar did, and the Assyrians did this also, they would take out of the nation the brightest and the best. A pretty good uh, military strategy when you think of it. Take away the leaders. Take away the intelligent, gifted leaders uh, who've been, who, you know, take away the best and the brightest who are going to lead the nation. Um, take the business owners. Take the, take the head politicians although sometimes we might like that, um, you know, take out, take out all the leaders. And, um, and, and then after you have, you, you have no leaders left, then in 586, Nebuchadnezzar comes in one more time and destroys the temple. So if you want to go up to that next slide there. Uh, yeah, Nebuchadnezzar destroys the temple and captures King Zedekiah. So in that first deportation in 605 or 597 or both, he takes out people like Jehoiakim, the last true king in Judah, and imprisons him, doesn't kill him, because remember, God promised that the line of 
David would continue. So that's kind of a neat thing, the way 2 Kings ends, is Jehoiakim, although he was captured in his final days, he's brought back out and eats at the king's table as a way to say, yeah, they were carried off into Babylon, but the, king, the line of David still is alive, even in Babylon. And then the, the, these um, people, um, these people who, who maybe you've heard before, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are also part of that first deportation. They were kind of these young men who are very uh, skilled, highly qualified, the best and the brightest, top of their class kind of people taken off into Babylon. Um, as well. So that was, that was how Nebuchadnezzar did it. And then in, in 586, he surrounds um, Jerusalem, starves the city, and it got so bad that I don't know if this is hyperbole, because this is kind of comes up quite a bit in the Old Testament. So you wonder if this was just kind of um, as a way of saying it got so bad that even mothers were eating their children. That's how hungry they were. Whether that happened or not, um, it's kind of this hyperbolic language of Nebuchadnezzar starved out the city and then he attacked it. And, um, and the temple was destroyed. And there's no way that we could, I don't know, maybe if, 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 if you lived in Washington, D.C. and you saw the White House getting taken down or... You know, just something very, you know, if we were to, to, to live in New York and we were invaded and we saw, I mean, the Twin Towers, those were these monumental, uh, when, that, when that went down, that was symbolic um, moment of, of, of these the, you know, kind of the headquarters of our, our financial institutions and things like that, watching the Twin Towers go down uh, had that kind of deep impact on our life. Um, and kind of, that's what it was like, but at, even higher when they turned around and saw um, their temple go down. And, and there's a psalm. Oh, what's the psalm? I don't know off the top of my head. Is it Psalm 137 maybe? Where it says, um, at the waters of ba- Babylon, we hung our harps on the poplars as our captors told us to sing songs of Jerusalem, something like that. And they're just lamenting. They're just walking down. They're, they're being carried off as captors, um, as slaves into Babylon. And in the review mirror, the temple is being destroyed. The temple is what Solomon built. The temple is where God met with them. The temple was where the presence of God was. The temple uh, was a symbol of their, of their nation, of their people. It, it, it symbolized that God was with them. Is the place where they met God and received forgiveness as they had daily sacrifices. The place, the whole, a whole big deal. So, oh yeah, thanks. This Sable's mentioned 9-11 too. So yeah, thank you for, for that same thing. So, and so you, you hear this, over and over again in the Psalms, in the book of Jeremiah, uh, this lamenting. And then there's a whole book that, that many people subscribe to, uh, to Jeremiah, Jeremiah writing this, this short book after the book of Jeremiah, Lamentations, where he is just pouring out his soul, um, you know, uh, just repenting of his sin, that he was the cause, that we were the cause, and they're just, he's just bawling. And this is a great, you know, I, I know some a pastor friend of mine, a uh, pastor from St. John's in Milwaukee, uh, Ben Zach, him and his wife, when the pandemic hit, he read through Lamentations uh, just because giving words to the pain that we feel that, that things are not the way they're supposed to be you know, lamenting over the shooting and the rioting and the, and the, and the, and the police violence and all those things. Oh, hey, that was a good guess, I guess. Psalm 137. Thank you, Los family. Um, so I'm just going to read from Lamentations. Lamentations is another beautiful pic, uh, structure of Hebrew poetry. I've, I've said this over and over again. Usually, if you want to know the high point of Hebrew poetry, you go to the center. 
And so like the center of the book of Job is I know my Redeemer lives. In the middle of all of his anguish and, and, and lamenting and pain, at the center of the book of, Je- of, of Job is I know my Redeemer lives. And in the middle of all of their crying out and pain, at the center of the book of Lamentations is this. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. You know, just, oh, I, I re, I'm just, I'm feeling my bitterness. Yet, this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Such a beautiful uh, light in a very dark time in history. So here's some application ideas. Sometimes the most spiritual thing that we can do is weep and lament. Uh, Sometimes it's, I I remember... um, being there for, for a woman as, as her, her husband of 40 years old had, had died of a heart attack and I was called to the scene and all we did was get on our knees and cry and just weep for, for what just happened. And no, there's no words, there was no, no Bible passages, no, and, and even in the story of Job, when his friends came for seven days, they didn't say a word and, and, and they started having problems when they opened their mouth. Um, and, and so sometimes all we can do is weep. And, and you know, obviously right now we're in a time of, of weeping and lamenting. Um, <sighs> say well, family, thank you. Lamenting is lost in our society. We teach our kids to stuff their feelings rather than grieve appropriately. It's emotionally healthy. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think my wife does this so much better, just feeling those emotions because unaddressed trauma is transferred trauma. Unadde- unaddressed uh, mourning and suffering is transferred to other people. You, you don't, if you don't deal with it yourself, you'll, you'll spill it onto other people. And so the Bible is filled with lamenting. Really, um, I, I heard this from Tim Mackey. I really appreciate this. When you read the, the Psalms, the Psalms, the first, uh, uh, many of the first Psalms in the book of Psalms is laments. It's pounding on God's chest. It's, it's crying out to God. It's being honest with God. And then you get some kind of um, peppered in song, Psalms of praise. And then less and less lamenting up until the final Psalms of like 148 through 150 and 51, all those are all praise. So it's like lamenting to praise. That's the, that's the journey of a Christian, of lamenting all of our losses and moving to praise. So, so sometimes the most spiritual thing we can do is weep and lament. Um, and then yet, even in the middle, literally in the middle of lamentations, we still have hope. Um, because we believe in a resurrection. Because we believe, like Job said, I know my Redeemer lives. And so there was always this hope that God had plans for Israel to bring them back from Babylon, to reestablish them, and to bring in a Messiah. So, maybe it, this is too obvious of a question, but, but maybe we can broaden it a little bit. List all of the specific reasons you might be lamenting today. List, list all of the specific reasons uh, you might be lamenting today. Thank you, Thompson. Psalm 22, yeah. List all the reasons that you might be lamenting today. And what happens when you don't lament? What happens when you, when you don't take time to weep, to cry, to to walk through that, what, what happens when you stuff it? What's that? You explode, yeah, all right. You explode. Um, yeah, the, 
that We Are Messengers song, uh, Maybe It's Okay to Not Be Okay. Yeah, I, I heard them sing that. The first time I didn't know who they were, we were at a concert and they, they, they opened for somebody and just the stories behind that music, uh, We Are Messengers has that great song. Um, also, um, yeah, there's, a, there's quite a few great, great songs that right now are really good about lamenting, you know, uh, God Only Knows, uh, there's quite quite a few, yeah. All right. Anything else that wanted to talk about la- lamenting, lamentations? I mean, obviously, right now, uh, lamenting the fact that 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 uh, you know George Floyd was murdered, uh, lamenting uh, uh, racism, lamenting that. You know, could you make the point? You know, I don't want to go too strong with this, but those who, when we when we don't find a healthy way to lament and mourn, uh, it turns in it turns deep, right? So it gets, um, okay, yeah, I can't lament. I just feel anger and sadness in this country, right? And well, that's what lamenting is, right? It's that anger and sadness kind of put together, right? Yeah. Yeah, very good. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, and that's that's the reality. Probably the real stuff, right, is the stuff uh, that doesn't probably work on a chat room online. So thank you, Dave. So, you know, all those different things that, that we all are going through that process. The Psalms take us through that journey. The Book of Lamentations, the whole story of Israel. I mean, you could you could just project your life onto the story of Israel of, of, you know, think about yourself being enslaved in sin, coming out of slavery of sin, your own coming out of Egypt, passing through the waters of your baptism, all the trials that you faced in your own wilderness of life, learning to trust in God when you thought life was going to be easy after you became a Christian, uh, entering into maybe having some high moments in your life, and then uh, maybe the second cross of your life. You know, you think about um, maybe failures later on in life, and and your own kind of being exiled. Just this whole idea of of of, of you know the the story of Israel is probably more your story. Um, yeah, losing work, losing friend uh, uh, to cancer. Um, yeah not be able to sing in the last choir concert, you know, all, all, all the gradu- all the things that we've lost, all the things that we've lost through this pandemic, all the things that we've lost through these trials. Uh, so thank you for, for mentioning all those. Okay. Now we go into ex- uh, exile becomes the new normal for Israel. They were the false prophets were saying, don't worry, don't unpack your bags. You're going to go back to Judah very soon. It's, you know, this is all going to blow over. And, uh, and, and, you know, we might have thought of that for lots of different things, all the things that maybe put us in our own exile. Maybe we thought, you know, as we saw the culture changing a decade or two ago, uh, really drastically, as as so many things have changed, and we saw people uh, flee the church, and the church is now seen more and more as the enemy in society. You know, bigoted, closed-minded, wrong on all the issues. Um, we might thought, oh, this will blow over. We saw young people leaving the church in 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 droves a decade or two ago. Ago, we thought. Oh, that will all blow over. Once they have kids and settle down, they'll all come back to church. Well, we're not seeing that. Um, and so there's so many things about our culture um, that, that, you know, just... Uh, so many things about our culture that, that, that are changing that it's not, it's not going away. Um, you know, and the effects of this pandemic, uh, how quick, you know, we might think, oh, this is going to go away quickly. Um, and that's what a lot of people were thinking in, in the days of Jeremiah. So Jeremiah wrote them a letter, wrote them a letter. Okay. 
And this is what Jeremiah wrote in the letter. Now, you might have, you might have some of these th- this words, uh, especially Jeremiah, I think that's 19 or it's 11 or whatever that is. Uh, I know the plans I have for you. Um, you might have that on a plaque somewhere. Um, but if you know the context of, of, this, of, of, that, of that verse, I know the plans I have for you, I think that verse is even richer. So I'm going to read this. Jeremiah 29, he's writing a letter. He, uh, when, when, when Babylon came in in 605 and took, off the leader, took out the leaders, and then when they came in in 586 and destroyed the temple, there was a small remnant, a small group of people that stayed back. And they had it really tough. And Jeremiah was one of those people who stayed back. He, he didn't go into exile. And he was protected still, but it was very hard. And he's writing, um, he's writing a letter to the exiles. And he says this. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage. So they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of this city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it. Because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Do not let the prophets, in quotation marks, and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams they, uh, you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. And what were the prophets saying? They were saying, um, you know, it's going to be quick. Don't worry, don't unpack your bags. You're going to go back quickly. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me. And I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. This is a beautiful section. And and, and so, Jeremiah is saying, God said, I carried you into exile. You're not, gonna, you're not leaving there, so plant a garden. Have some babies. Pray, to, uh, pray for this city. Yes, the one that destroyed your temple, pray for that city. Increase there, do not decrease. This is your new home. This is your new normal. Figure it out. And many people were going to die in, in Babylon and so now that the temple is destroyed, many people believe that this is where the synagogue worship started, where they, synagogue, it's the Greek word for like small gathering, to gather together in smaller groups. So instead of now worshiping in the temple, now they were worshiping in smaller congregations. Um, so Jeremiah is saying, and, and Dave Long, I appreciate you asked this in the, in the U version uh, discussion group. Uh, you know, you want to know what is it, what, how do you live a life in, in this kind of exiled world, to be in the world but not of the world? And, and, um, and, and I think this is a beautiful section here. Um, l- let me just kind of, again, set the stage a little bit more and then, and then, and then speak about it. Um, They were going to be living in a foreign country now with foreign gods and foreign ideals. And, 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 and there were going to be so many things that they disagreed with in Babylon. And yet they had to learn to live with their core values. Um, and then they had to learn uh, to, 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 to make this their new home. They had to learn to, to, to now find a way to make this home. And so I think that's the, 
that's a beautiful picture of what it's like for us. Our country is probably not the one you grew up in, right? Maybe, I mean, the block I grew up on, uh, everyone was a Christian. Christianity was cool. Uh, you know, everybody went to church. There was this kind of, uh, you know, if you were a business owner, you'd put the fish emblem on your business card and they would get better business. If you wanted to run for, for, to be a, the president or a, or a, or a, or a, you know, a politician, you, you, you let people know which church you went to. That was then, and then everything really switched um, a few years, basically after 9-11. There's a lot of reasons why, but we switched. Um, and you could argue that that went back farther, but Christianity is no longer in the majority. And so maybe there was this idea, and I don't know if it was healthy, of this moral majority. Like if we didn't like something going on in the culture, we didn't like that uh, you know, Disney World was promoting this one agenda and so let's boycott Disney or we didn't like that that TV station was doing that so let's boycott that TV show we thought we could do that back in the 80s and 90s the moral majority Christians are a small group right now they they don't have any weight to throw around we are exiled in our own country and so now we have to take the posture of an exile to find a way to love our city recognize that they're not waiting for us to, um, uh, to take the lead. We don't, we don't have the power or influence that we can throw our weight around. All we have left is love. And so, um, and, and so I think another great picture of that would be Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In the opening chapter of Daniel, um, in the opening chapter of Daniel, they are, are taught in the Babylonian language. They're given Babylonian names. They're, they're, they're taught in, in Babylonian um, uh, schools. They got this great Babylonian education. And they were going to serve Nebuchadnezzar as best as they could. But when they were told to eat the food that was sacrificed to idols, that's where they wouldn't cross the line. They had these deep core values that there were things that they could do and things that went against their core values as a believer in Yahweh, in the Lord. And so, again, when Nebuchadnezzar demanded that they bow down to this golden statue, they had these deep core values um, that they were not going to bow down to the statue. Um, and, and, you know, they, they said, you know, even if God doesn't save us, we're not going to bow down. You can throw us in the fiery furnace, that's fine. When the Persians came in later on, Daniel prayed three times a day and he served um, Darius, the, the, the governor or the king. And yet when they told me he had to stop praying, he would not stop those values. He had those core values. And so I think um, that is, that's where it's at. Where you need to, We need to figure out what are our core values. What, what do we hold on? What does it mean to be a Christian, to be a, in the kingdom of God, and, and I think there, there, there's a lot of them, um, but, but maybe I could throw out a few. A high view of Scripture, that Jesus is the only way back to the Father, that he is the only way. Um, I have a core value that all people are created equal. So a core value of an, you know, that, that, that um, racism is wrong. Um, and also that killing people of any age, right? Uh, euthanasia, abortion, all those things, that that's wrong. Um, these core values. But then the, the core values that we should be uh, helping the poor, that we should look after the poor. Uh, core values of justice for the poor. Uh, core values of racial equality. And you, when you start having these core values, you start to realize that they don't necessarily fit in a clear uh, political party. They don't necessarily fit um, in, in clearly in culture. And so to be a Christian is to have these core values about Scripture, about humanity, about morality that don't fit nicely into um, a certain political party or a certain worldview. Um, Christianity is always going to be countercultural. And, and we just always have a tendency to maybe 
lift up a core value that maybe aligns with a, a, a political party or a group of people or, or some part of culture and then to dismiss the ones that, that maybe are countercultural or, or countercultural in our community or our politics. And, and as a Christian, we just have to take on all those core values and have some deeper, um, deeper uh, uh, convictions on those. Uh, convictions about mercy, okay? So there's a, there's a lot there, and I think Daniel is just a great, great picture. Um, how are we doing with time here? Doing okay. All right. No one's falling asleep yet, right? Maybe I could... Uh, I'm, I'm just kind of looking here. I'm seeing a lot of comments about lamenting and, and um, you know, exile and, and, and thing, uh, you know, going from lamenting and then moving into exile, allowing this new normal to sink in and, and, and finding a hope there. Um, maybe I could just... <sighs> tell you a little bit of my story, and, and maybe that would be helpful. Uh, I had just a great experience in my previous congregation, just um, uh, an incredible church that really was trying to reach the community and supported me incredibly. Uh, but the hardest part of it was all of a sudden some really good friends uh, did not, all of a sudden, took out personal attacks against me and just kind of went after me. And all of a sudden, and I don't know if I handle those correctly or how I, and, and so much of this past year has been kind of lamenting uh, lost friendships. These people that I deeply cared about, but then kind of turned on me and my family in the last couple uh, months there. And all of a sudden, and, and, and so trying to, to start over here and then believe what God said through Jeremiah, I know the plans I have for you, um, plans to prosper you and to, uh, and, and to give you a hope and a future and to make Franklin this new home by, by kind of working through all of that. And, and you know, I, I think I've mentioned from the pulpit, you know, I, mean, I see a counselor too every once in a while working through just lamenting, uh, you know, torn relationships, uh, you know, sabotage, all these things, and yet loving the church, loving the people, loving that experience, loving so much of us were there, and to feel like, all right, now God has called you here, and how do you now work through all that. So I saw you guys were, you know, hard to be vulnerable on, on a chat room, but I just want to at least tell you a little bit of my story and working through that and what that, that looks like. But then to hold on to these promises that, all right, if God calls you to a new place, if, if he leads you out of a, a difficult place, um, and, and you have all these torn emotions about that, that, that he has plans for you. So, so what, what God says to the people, uh, in, in exile, plant a garden. That's what I did. I, did. I literally planted a garden just to kind of hold on to this, right? Ma you know, make this your new home. Um, you know, marry, uh, give in to marriage. Give your sons and daughters into marriage. You know, uh, make this your new home because this, you're not going anywhere for a while and I'm going to be with you. I have plans for you. So um, just, I, I think this is such a beautiful picture. We preached on this a little bit in the Exile series, but I mean, I think there's so much more that we need to think about when it comes to this um, idea of um, figuring out what our core values are, how can we love the people of our culture, love the people of our community without giving up on our core convictions? How do we make this our new home? How do we not always say, oh, the good old days before, you know, Christianity was, wasn't so in such a difficult spot, all oh, the good old days before this, uh, and to live in the present and to really uh, believe that God has um, has done, uh, d done 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 for us here, okay? Or God is with us here. All right. So just some application points here to ex for exiles. Because Christians are in the minority, our life and faith is similar to the ex exiles, right? So it, I think. 
if we were to compare ourselves with somebody in the Old Testament, it's not Solomon and his kingdom or Moses and his rule, like, like that we can just put the Ten Commandments up in our society and expect everybody to follow them. And just to think that God, we can have like this theocracy where God is, is, is going to be the, the king of our country. Um, we're, we're, so that's not the comparison, I think, that's accurate of where we are today, that, that we live comparatively to Moses' time or Solomon's time or David's time where we're in a believing culture. I think if we are to um, connect to a culture or a time period in the Bible, it's the exiles because they were in the minority. They had to learn how to maneuver things and, uh, and live in the world but not of the world. Okay? And so that's the next major point. We need to follow the example of Jeremiah, Daniel, and his friends. They were in the world but not of the world. You know, just keep reading those sections. Keep reading about the life of exiles. And God has good plans for his exiles. Um, to purify and strengthen our faith. All these trials of, you know, at one level you might, churches are shrinking, um, uh, the pandemic, the rioting and racism, all these things make you feel more and more like you're an exile in your own home, like you're an exile in your own community. And yet God has good plans. People are coming to faith in the middle of this. Um, and we are reaching people that we wouldn't have reached in the times of prosperity. People are purifying their faith. They have a deeper faith. There's all sorts of plans that God has for us in the middle of this. This is not just a, a time for a holding pattern. This is not woe is me. Um, this is a time to live out our faith and, and remind remarkable ways God is going and and you know that's what we see in the stories of the exile you know like okay if you think about all you've read so far up into today it's like one negative story after another right David falls with Bathsheba and and Uriah Solomon falls um, all uh, you know, the kings fall over and over again. In the it, when they are in the majority, they are falling. They are are giving in their faith. But what are the brightest spots in Israel's history? In the exile, you got these bright lights like Ezekiel and Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego doing these incredible um, witnessing of their faith, standing up for for God in their faith. You know, just incredible acts of, of bravery and courage and 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 strength that happened in the exile. Uh, and so, I believe in in these kind of exile times, we're going to see people uh, displaying their faith, growing in their faith, uh, testifying to their faith in remarkable ways um, that, that, that we didn't see back in the 1980s and 1990s. Okay, I'm seeing a question here from the Sabal family uh, about Jeremiah buying a land and God promises to keep, him, to keep him safe. In the end, he gets taken to Egypt and we don't really know what happened to him. How can we reconcile chapter 32 when it seems like Jeremiah didn't actually get to live on the land he purchased like God promised? Great question. Yeah, I don't know if he did. Uh, but I think it was a picture that maybe Jeremiah wasn't going to come back to the land, but the people would. Um, so I think there's a lot of pictures like that in the book of Jeremiah that, that he does things just for the picture. You know, Jeremiah is not allowed to mourn um, or go to funerals. Is it Ezekiel whose wife dies and he can't go to his wife's funeral? You know, so some of these things that they were supposed to go do, they were all symbolic. Buying the land was symbolic. Whether he was to, to live in the land or not, um, it was symbolic for something it would be crazy. You, you, wouldn't buy, um, you wouldn't buy land in a war zone. But that's what he did. He bought land in a war zone because he had, he had a belief that, um, that, that God's people would come back there again. So I think it's more symbolic than, than literal. He literally bought the land, but I don't, yeah, I don't know if he actually lived on the land. Um, so, great question. All right. Then the discussion question there is, in what ways have all the recent challenges purified and strengthened your faith? Is there something you've seen in your faith um, as the church shrinks in society, as the church is more under attack, as, um, 
you know, even through this COVID crisis, pandemic, uh, is there, and then now the recent riots and the killer hornets, right? That thing that happened to their, you know, is there something about your faith that's been different? Is there any, do you have any, maybe not, or maybe someone you know where you've seen some, some stronger testimonies, some bolder testimonies of people's faith or your faith during this time of exile? Anyone? Reichert's? Blue, Bloomer? Bueller? Is that, yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Ferris Bueller? Bueller? Um, You're not saying anything? All right, Nancy, what did, what, did, what did Jill say? What did she say? That's really good. That's great, yeah. So the, the point was made um, that in the pandemic, we've had to take on our own faith. You know, we've, you know, we've had to take ownership of our own faith. And, and I've seen that, people doing that. All right, we're going to lead the devotion. We're going to talk about it. We're going to pray. We're going to gather the people in the living room. We're going to discuss the sermon. We're going we're gonna to have a devotion. We're going to, you know, so. Um, oh, yeah, all right. So, so, so I think, you know, that personal ownership uh, the Lowe's family said things like the Getty family hymn sing on Tuesday night where 5,000 people watched. I, yeah, I, w- I, I don't know if I didn't, I didn't know, I think I heard about that. I didn't watch that, but that, that must have been amazing. Um, the faith strengthens, Schmidt family, faith strengthens the world spinning around us because God's word doesn't change. Um, you know, Watching the sermon alone, Sharon says, it's like God and her are alone together. Yeah, so so many good things there. Um, you know, priorities change. You do have time for God's word, right? That's really great. Very good. Yeah, so there are things that are happening in exile um, that, and in these challenges, in these purifying times that just won't happen in times of prosperity. Where is the church growing the most? I, I remember talking to, a, a, to a, chi- a, a missionary in China. And he said it was so different. In Hong Kong, which is China, but Hong Kong has some more freedoms and so they have more prosperity. The church is just kind of limping along. But in mainline China, where there's all the persecution and all the challenges and all the economic challenges and and all the the communist regime, that's where the church is exploding and people are holding on to their faith. Um, And so that's, that's you know, I think that's just another example, you know. All right. So Jennifer's been reading her Bible every day. That's so good. Small group on Zoom. So good. So good. I'm so encouraged by people reading their Bible every day. Okay. So that's life in the exile. Uh, um, Learning to make this today your home. Making this your home. Making this is the reality. Not just uh, waiting for the future. Not just trying to live like a plane in a holding pattern. Uh, Save all family. Recognizing how all the other challenges we've had in the past few years prepared us for this. Yeah. One thing after another, and and um, all the things that the Sable family's been through, and then yeah, they're they're ready ready for this. Um, you know, I've heard this like, um, you know, God promises to never give you more than you can handle, and then somebody said like, I wish God didn't have so much confidence in me, you know. <laughs> So and the reality is he gives us more than we can handle so that we trust in him. So Dave says, up until now I hedge my bets, so to speak, to take care of things on my own just in case he did not come through. Uh, that has all changed and I'm seeing some pretty great things happen that I never would have expected. I, I'm learning to trust more. Yeah. I don't know. I'm 37. I think I'm kind of moving through my midlife crisis, right? Where like so many things you thought were an easy shoe in 
and things that were so planned and I have this plan or I write things down and I try to, uh, you know, make everything go exactly the way I planned. And man, I just feel like so many things I planned have just exploded and didn't work. And so learning to trust, to hold on my plans lightly and to trust more. Okay. All right. So that was living in the Excel. Now, hope Hope in the exile. We've already talked a little bit about Jeremiah predicting that, that he knows the plans for, that God knows the plans he has for us, plans not to harm us, uh, to give us hope in the future. But then the second half of Isaiah is really one of hope. Um, so Isaiah 1 through 39 really is describing life before the exile. And then 40 through 61, or, I don't know, is it 66? I'm sorry. 40 through 66. Uh, is really the hope after exile. And so many people believe that, that the second book of Isaiah, or second half, 40 through 66, was maybe not written by Isaiah. Because Isaiah lived 722, 730 B.C. Um, and, you know, the exile happened in 590 or 586. And then the return from the exile, you know, back like 536, you know, so 200, 300 years before, uh, later than Isaiah. So, but, but the second half of Isaiah is all about comfort after the exile. So I'm just going to read this. Uh, I, uh, Isaiah 40 says this. I mean, the whole chapter is amazing, but kind of jumps off the page. Comfort, comfort my people says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. Kind of like, com- get comfort from God. Be- you-, you get comfort because, you know what? The time is over. The exile's done. Um, it- you're coming to the end of this. You've had your time of discipline. Now it's time for comfort. Um, And then the rest of Isaiah is just like that. Isaiah 45 explains how that comfort is first going to be um, received. Um, Isaiah 45 says this. This is what the Lord says to his anointed. You could say his Messiah. To Cyrus, whose right hand I, ha- I take hold of to subdue the nations before him and to sub- strip kings of their armor, to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. So um, the first servant that God was going to raise up is Cyrus, the king of the Persians. So I think it was Bob Los who said that... Um, God was raising up all these nations. He was raising up the nation of Babylon. So yeah, God, God uses these worldwide empires to, for the good of his church. So he first raised up Assyria, and they became a world power, and then they went away. Then he raised up Babylon. They became a world power. Then they went away. Then he raised up the Persians. And Cyrus had this incredible diplomatic way of dealing with the nations. When he would conquer a nation, he would find ways to compromise with the nation he conquered. And and so with Israel, he said, oh, you guys want to go back and build your temple? I'll fund that. And so he he built alliances with the nations that he conquered. And so that's what God is predicting here, that God was going to um, or use Cyrus, the king of Persia, uh, to, sub, to, to, to fund the rebuilding of the temple. And that's what Cyrus did. Kind of cool, there was an archaeological find called the Cyrus Cylinder. Uh, it was a, a, a cylinder that was written all around, uh, written about Cyrus. And he, it was a kind of a decree where he did the same thing for other nations. So what Cyrus did for Israel was very, uh, much in how he dealt with the other nations. And that's kind of cool. And archaeology and biblical history work together. So the first servant, the first Messiah, the first anointed one that God uses is a foreign king, a foreign emperor, Cyrus, the king of Persia, to rebuild the temple that, Sol- or that, that uh, Babylon destroyed. 
Isaiah 49 then uh, talks about um, other, another servant. Isaiah 49 says this. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel. So Israel is a servant in whom I will display my sp- splendor. He says, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and to bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. So God says through Isaiah that Israel is going to be a servant and he's going to restore the nations, but this servant Israel is going to have a mission to Israel. And so you're supposed to ask the question, all right, well, this servant must not just be the nation of Israel, it must be someone from Israel. And we would understand that as the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Jesus is this servant. And he's got a worldwide plan to restore all the nations, to be a light to all the Gentiles, to be a light to all the people. And there's so many pictures of this, but probably the clearest picture is Isaiah 53, the shocker how God was going to restore all the nations to himself, how God was going to bring back all the people to himself. Isaiah 53 says, He, that's the servant, the servant was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. So ultimately, a Messiah who would be pierced and crushed and punished and wounded would restore Israel um, after Babylon. Uh, And not just restore the tribes back to Israel, but restore all the world back to God. And that's ultimately in Jesus. So, they would return to Jerusalem after 70 years, funded by Cyrus. The Persians would help them rebuild the temple, rebuild the walls around the temple. We'll read about that in the books like Nehemiah and and Ezra, um, and in the books of 1 and 2 Chronicles. But ultimately, um, Jesus would restore all nations. The, the, the second temple was nothing like Solomon's temple. They still had a bunch of messes and problems. And then the Romans and the Greeks and the Romans would come in and destroy that temple also. Um, and so the hope would never be in this second temple. The hope would ultimately be in Jesus the Messiah. Okay. I'm going on and on. Hopefully you're still at the end, at the, uh, still up there. Uh, let, me, let me just... Uh, Talk about some application points here. Application number one, God has plans to comfort his people. Yes, he brings a message, a hard message like Jeremiah's message of judgment, of repentance, to tear down, to destroy, to uproot, um, to to, 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 to destroy. But he also has a message of rebuilding, of planting us again, a message of hope. And, and Jesus is the main character and the hero of, the his, of history. He's the one who's ultimately going to bring us hope. Uh, if you learn one thing as you read the Old Testament is nobody is, is pulling this off. There's no heroes. All the great guys are screwing everything up. Daniel is about as close as they get. And so we're all looking for somebody who, who can lead us back to God, and that's ultimately Jesus. Um, he's the one who brings us back from exile. He's the one who brings us back to God. He's the one who makes us feel at home, even when we are in exile. Uh, he's the one who, who rescues his people. Okay, some final discussion questions here. How does the story of Israel's exile help you live in, in, out our story in today's world? How does this whole story um, help inform your story? And then find, uh, finally, explain how we can make Jesus the hero of our story as we live in exile. Um, there's no heroes besides Jesus. Nobody's pulling this off. And we get totally emptied of our plans. Uh, we get totally disillusioned with our hopes and dreams. And all we got left is Jesus. So how can we make him the hero of our story? Okay. Any, any, uh, 
Any, any comments on that? Any, any response to how does, how does the story of Judah in exile inform your story? And then how can you make Jesus the hero of your story? Jill, two for two? No? You did such a good job that last one. I like that. Nancy, anybody? Any thoughts on that? How does Israel's story help inform our story? Does it help you in any way? And then how can we make Jesus the hero of our story? Okay, love others. Yeah, yeah. Don't make it about you. Make it about loving people. Um, and, and that's, I think, because Jesus has already conquered our enemies, already uh, given us hope in a future, we can spend all of our energy on loving others. Yeah. We need to let others see Jesus in us while we are in exile. That's, that's kind of what Nancy said too, so very good. The Los family picked up on that. I don't know who came up with it first. That's close. Close tie, I think, there. All right. What, what I f- appreciate the most, and I'll, you know, I, I'll keep talking it unless other people bring up some points, what I think is so important is the Bible is not just a self-help book. The Bible is not just a, a, a book about positivity and, you know, um, everything's going to be fine and there's no problems ever. The Bible tells a hard story about pain and suffering and about all these issues. And yet God continues to call his people back. He continues to, to give them hope in a future. Um, Sable said, we've moved so many times. I lean into the Excel story to remind me to bloom where I'm planted, to be a light for Jesus in every new community you've lived. Yeah, that's how I feel too. I'm still, still new here and trying to make this new place my home, right? Uh, Lowe's family will provide opportunities for us to share the good news of, of our hero, Jesus. The battle is over. The victory is, is, is Jesus. Yeah, very good. I just, I, I think the Bible... This story of exile lets us talk about the hard things of life, the realities where our life has taken detours that we didn't expect. Who predicted the pandemic? Who predicted the murders and the riots and the protests? Who predicted all these problems and these sad things? Who predicted these these detours in your life, the the cancers or the job loss or the, the changes or the family struggles or the... Who predicted all of this? These are just these complete interruptions and they put us in these exile moments and we have to learn to, to plant again, to build again, to live again, to make a, this new reality our new home and, and God says he's there with us and they're not detours to God. They're all part of his ultimate good plans for us. Okay? That's all I have unless anybody else has some final words of wisdom. I hope this was helpful. Anything else on the daily reading, uh, where we're going? Um, just maybe a couple more comments on the day, day-to-day reading and, and the YouVersion Bible app. We're trying to follow how the, the Hebrews had ordered their Old Testament. I don't, I, I don't know why always. I don't always understand the logic. Uh, so after Jeremiah, we won't go right into Lamentations. We will go into Ezekiel. What I do like about the order of the books of the Bible we're going to be reading is Chronicles comes at the very end. And the book of First and Second Chronicles is a retelling, like a reframing, retelling the story of Israel without all the bad stories. So you don't, in the book of Chronicles, you don't have the story of David killing Bathsheba, or Uriah for Bathsheba. You don't have Solomon and all of his, his problems. Um, it, it's, like, it's like they've come back from exile. They want to retell the story of Israel from God's perspective of forgiveness. So we'll read First and Second Chronicles at the end of the Old Testament. Uh, so that's something different too. All right. If nothing else, I will close with, with prayer. I thank you guys so much um, uh, thank you. Oh, great, we'll listen to a song at the end of this. 
thank you so much for the participation, for your comments. Thank you so much for this time to study God's Word. Thank you for the daily Bible reading and you guys staying involved in this. Uh, this has just been uh, such a life-giving thing for me and just been so, so appreciative of what I'm learning from all of you as well. So uh, why don't I close with a prayer? Um, Lord God, how did we get here? Uh, man, just like it says in Psalm 139, you know, we, we hang our harps on the poplars as we remember the, the days back in, 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 in Jerusalem. We feel that. We, we, we hang our harps on the, on, on the trees. We, we don't want to sing songs because we have a heavy heart uh, of all the, the pain and suffering that's going on right now in our world and all the individual uh, pain and trauma that, that even the people in our group have, have faced in their lives and all the ways that we're all lamenting. But your mercies are new every morning, like it says in the Center of Lamentations. Great is your faithfulness. Give us hope and the ability to, to walk forward in hope because of the cross. Because Jesus, you came down in the middle of our exile. You came down in the middle of our darkness and you met us there with your blood and your we cries like we, we, we. of pain. And now we walk through on the other side following your resurrection. Now in this new hope, help us to, to live where we are today, wherever, whatever that means, to be present today, to build, to plant, to pray for this city, to be a part of this city, to be a part of our lives, to, to make this new reality our home because you have good plans for us. Help us to walk in faith. We ask all this in your name. Amen.